Everyday life is usually a pretty boring routine. When you sit down and think about it, it's largely just the same list of mundane events happening over and over again every day of your life. It's a part of the human condition. We get bored of the usual very quickly. But the fun thing about being a human is that your big brain allows for creativity. And thanks to this, you don't have to stay in the real world 24-7. Everyone deserves some escapism from time to time, and listening to the stories of fictional characters is the best way of achieving that escape. Telling people stories has been used to teach important lessons since the beginning of time itself. And with the rise of stories, spawns the creation of fiction. It allowed for more surreal storytelling, as well as an increased amount of creativity needed for crafting a world. In a real story, Timothy goes to the grocery store. In a fictional story, Timothy meets his father in space. The sky's the limit as to what can happen in a story. And every engaging story shares a common attribute. And that attribute is conflict. If there's no problem that needs to be solved, then why are we watching these characters doing nothing of value? That'd just be a waste of your time. Conflict creates tension, and tension is very much something needed in order to keep people engaged in the story unfolding in front of them. To care about the characters, we need stakes. And in most cases, the easiest way to induce conflict is to have an antagonist. Antagonists have been around for as long as stories themselves, with the most widely known villain of all time being from a novel thousands of years ago. The universal symbol of villainy, the root of all evil, the fallen angel, Satan, also known as the Devil. And villains have only gotten more prevalent and fleshed out since then. In the oversaturation of today's age, while it isn't uncommon to see a villain with a complete lack of all character, relatability, and entertainment value, there are also a good number of villains that do have these positive traits. And in the world of comic books, no hero has a list of villains on the same level as Batman. Batman has what's possibly the greatest collection of villains a superhero can possess, with each and every member of his rogues gallery reflecting on a trait that already exists within Bruce himself. Two-Face uses a coin flip to decide his morality surrounding the fate of those around him. And Batman decides his morality surrounding the criminals around him, with his own moral compass built from his own experiences. Bane is stronger than Batman, but he uses his strength for his own personal benefit rather than helping others. The Penguin uses his business knowledge and higher financial status to seek control over Gotham, while Bruce uses his money and status to improve conditions for the people. Whether it's by cleaning the streets of crime while wearing a bat suit, or by putting his money towards the Wayne Foundation to benefit people less directly. The Riddler shares Batman's intelligence, but unlike Bruce, Nygma feels a need to constantly show his superiority. And Mr. Freeze has resources comparable to Batman at times, but he chooses to use it for preserving the past rather than working to improve on the future. Even a character as seemingly brain-dead as Kite Man was expanded into a story about continuing forward in the face of adversity. Even though people in-universe find him dumb, he still keeps pushing forward. Kite Man. Hell yeah. But out of all these villains, there's no greater dynamic than Batman and the Joker. We all know the Joker as Batman's greatest nemesis, an agent of chaos and anarchy to contrast with Bruce's more put-together and serious demeanor. While most of Batman's rogues gallery is motivated by money, Joker burns it to the ground without a care in the world. While most of his roster would try to reveal Batman's identity, the Joker actively avoids it. He's an unhinged psychopath, so lost in his own insanity that he no longer cares for anything. That is, of course, aside from Batman. I don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? You complete. Me. They share a dichotomy that almost seems foreign to most standard antagonists. Throughout Batman media, there's something that seems to be alluded to time and time again. 
Is Batman the alter ego of Bruce Wayne, or is the multi-billionaire playboy Bruce Wayne the persona of Batman? The Joker is by all counts insane, yet he knows Bruce better than anyone ever could. They've both had to suffer through horrible events, but they end up in similar yet completely different situations because of it. Joker gets fucked over by society, and Batman can only exist because of it. In most stories, the dark, brooding, ominous figure in the shadows would be the villain, but instead, we have a brightly colored clown who makes people literally laugh themselves to death and blows up hospitals. In terms of hero movies, there's rarely ever as interesting of a dynamic. In the modern day, while superhero movies are at an all-time high, it's not uncommon to see supervillains being more surface level than ever, often falling into a common trope. That being, the villain is the hero, but opposite. Flash has Reverse Flash, Spider-Man has Venom, Shazam has Black Adam, Superman has General Zod, and the Crimson Chin has... I'm not even gonna say that one. While some of these characters have more creative and compelling executions than others, that's unfortunately the exception and not the rule. This trope isn't just limited to superhero flicks either. It's a staple of lazy writing that transcends all genres or mediums. The trope is known by the term evil counterpart, but for these characters, I'd rather call them evil supermen. In the following video, I'm going to take you through the stories of five characters, to really dissect their unique takes on how to fundamentally turn Superman into a proper supervillain. Batman is rather infamously known for having a plan to kill any member of the Justice League if they're to ever turn evil and put the world at risk. Is this all just his own paranoia building up to an unhealthy degree, or does he actually have some merit to keep a plan to kill anyone he meets while he fights alongside them? Well, short answer, yes. Heroes turning evil isn't anything new in the world of the DC Universe. Whether it's caused by hypnosis, other forms of brainwashing, or by other means is irrelevant. The Big Blue Boy Scout is often thought of as one of the most straightforwardly good heroes of all time, whenever he isn't on the cover in the 1950s. But what would happen if he'd ever be driven to go down the route of villainy? Well, we get to see that in action, in the hit 2013 video game, and comic, and movie, Injustice, Gods Among Us. Injustice was released for the PS3, Xbox 360, and Wii U in April of 2013, with a mobile spin-off coming out a few weeks before the game's full release. It was developed by NetherRealm Studios, the company behind the modern Mortal Kombat games. And much like Mortal Kombat, the campaign in Injustice has the chaptering system returning from Mortal Kombat vs. DCU and the 2009 reboot. So throughout the story, it has you jumping between different characters, like Batman, Superman, The Flash, and Green Lantern. The story takes place in an alternate universe, and things kick off right at the beginning of Superman's downward spiral. Metropolis, the city Superman's known for defending, was just blown up with a stolen nuclear warhead. But that wasn't even the worst thing to happen to him that day. The Joker drugged him with a modified version of Scarecrow's fear toxin in order to get Superman to see his love interest Lois Lane as Doomsday, a supervillain that can single-handedly destroy the entire Earth. Superman fought against Lois without holding back, 
and when she inevitably died and her heart stopped, it remotely activated the nuke on Metropolis, killing an estimated 11 million people. In the span of two minutes, Superman had lost anything and everything he had ever loved, and he is not happy about it. As the Joker is being questioned by Batman, Superman breaks into the interrogation room and begins to threaten him. After some taunting from the Joker, Superman finally snaps, sending him on a downward spiral where the idea of protecting and controlling the people around him are interchangeable. This whole origin story perfectly shows why the Joker is one of Batman's villains, the perfect foil to his character. Throughout all Batman media, quite often does he make the point that once you take a life, there's no way to turn back. The fact that Bruce didn't kill the Joker after detonating bombs on hospitals, turning one of his closest friends into one of his greatest enemies, and even killing one of his adopted sons, just goes to show how much restraint Batman has when it comes to dealing with Joker's shenanigans. Even saving his life on multiple occasions, Superman, on the other hand, doesn't have super strength in his moral code. Once it all happened, he became a man with nothing to lose, allowing him to punch right through Joker's chest without a second thought. His journey into tyranny is actually very similar to his role in Superman Red Sun, another story taking place in an alternate universe. But instead of him turning evil with a catastrophic event, in that film he just happens to land in Soviet Russia and ends up acting as their totalitarian leader. Back to Injustice, we cut to our main universe, where the members of the Justice League fight against their respective villains, and we go through a bare bones, typical Justice League plotline. One, later, and our heroes find themselves getting transported to an entirely different universe. So as it turns out, Superman, stricken with the grief of his now dead wife and kid, killed the Joker out of pure rage and vengeance. He decided that something of this magnitude is to never happen again. His goal is surprisingly not that far off from the usual Superman ideals. Keep the planet safe from all things that threaten it. But that moral compass quickly becomes twisted, when the freedom of the people is stripped under the guise of protection with something as minimal as littering being punishable by immediate execution. So, with him now having no concern about whether he kills people or not, he then proceeds to kill anyone and everyone that might stop him from creating true, 100% peace on Earth, free will or not. Most heroes actually end up in favor of this. Whether they agree with his morals or they're just following out of fear is irrelevant. Also, every hero that doesn't join him ends up getting brutally murdered. Throughout all this, Superman continues to believe that he's doing the right thing for the Earth as well as the human race, as anyone who tries to convince him otherwise, well, ends up dead. The next phase of his plan is to kill all supervillains, with no chance for redemption. He breaks into Arkham Asylum with the intention of killing the inmates, but Batman, Robin, and Nightwing are there to stop him. But, in an interesting turn of events, Robin, who's currently the assassin-trained Damian Wayne, believes that Superman's lethal methods are in fact better. So he joins Superman and the rest of the Justice League. Then they get into a little skirmish. A ton of inmates escape, and Nightwing is accidentally killed by Robin, creating a wedge between the duo. Despite this little delay in his plan, it doesn't seem to halt Superman's progress. He then proceeds to overthrow all governments, forcing Batman to go into hiding. So at this point, it seems like Superman now has complete power as well as his own regime. But as it turns out, there are actually two other groups. The Joker Clan, a group of Joker's former henchmen that are continuing to be opposed to Superman's reign to continue the Joker's rebellious spirit and the Insurgency, a small group of remaining heroes led by Batman. As he realizes that the peace Superman brings is only driven by the fear people feel towards him. And, as it turns out, the reason the heroes from the main universe were sent to the alternate one is because Batman needed their help to defeat Superman, alongside the help of Lex Luthor, someone who, in this universe, is Superman's best friend and closest ally. The plan is to get Batman's convenient kryptonite-powered gun from the Batcave in order to weaken Superman and toss him into a specialized cell. Throughout the course of the game, you jump between the perspective of different characters, and you can sit back and watch as the insurgency continues to push forward. 
That is, until Batman gets captured by the alternate universe heroes, and taken to the prison on Stryker's Island. So the alternate universe Batman goes to get the kryptonite gun to deal with Superman. But Black Adam shows up and destroys it, so now it needs to be repaired. Superman sees what they're doing, so he announces that Batman will soon be executed. The way Superman runs his worldwide empire is with fear. He tells them what to do, and they do it. But that doesn't make him a good leader or commander. His troops aren't actually loyal to him. They're just after their own self-preservation. And that makes them weak-willed soldiers. As the insurgency infiltrates Stryker's Island, we get a scene of the alternate universe Shazam and The Flash having a conversation about Superman's recent decision to execute Batman theorizing that it's all just a bluff. This goes to show that even Superman's allies are heavily questioning the validity and morality of what he's doing. Our heroes then free Batman from his would-be execution, giving Lex Luthor a brief opportunity to rebuild the kryptonite gun and make his one and only attempt at killing Superman once and for all, reworking the kryptonite gun into a deadly laser. Unfortunately for him, it doesn't work because Shazam uses a bolt of lightning to disable his mech suit. Superman breaks Lex's neck, putting an end to his former best friend. At this point, he becomes completely unhinged, even more than before, and he realizes that the people don't appreciate his protection. He brings up the idea of flattening Gotham City and Metropolis to prove a point, but Shazam speaks up, pointing out that it's well, you know, absolutely insane. Superman responds to this by murdering him in cold blood, completely ignoring the fact that 10 minutes ago, Shazam was the one that saved his life, and also that he's a literal child. So, seeing a kid getting murdered in front of him, Flash also realizes Clark's steady fall into insanity, so he goes on a little redemption arc of his own. Betraying Superman's regime, he meets up with the insurgency, and he tells them what's been going down. They come up with a new plan, since Lex failed on his mission. The alternative? To send the original, good Superman to fight against the evil one. Speaking of the evil one, now he's destroying Metropolis. Anyways, good Superman makes it to the alternate universe, preparing to fight himself. He makes his way to the Fortress of Solitude, where his evil counterpart has been waiting for him. Seeing the evil and regular Superman side by side, you really get to take note of the minute design differences between them. He looks malnourished unhealthy, perfectly representative of someone who's become sick with power. Unsurprisingly, good Superman is able to defeat the villain, and Injustice Superman is tossed into a specialized cell. Some might think that the power balancing makes no sense, since they're the same character with the same powers, but there's actually a pretty valid reason for the good guys winning more fights. That isn't just because we play as the good guys. The reason our heroes from the main dimension tend to be stronger than the alternative ones has to do with their resolve. The Justice League's MO is to fight evil without outright killing their enemies. It means they haven't crossed that line keeping them from becoming monsters. Not to mention that the only threat the regime fights is against the insurgency, since Joker's little cult is kinda treated as a joke. This means that they might have been out of practice while fighting stronger opponents, since they're almost all either dead or on Superman's side at this point. But our story doesn't end here. In fact, not by a long shot. There's actually a second game that was released four years later, in May of 2017. The story for this game follows the characters from the alternate dimension, with the original dimension characters only making brief appearances. After a flashback, to give more context to Superman's takeover of the whole world, the story here takes place directly after the events of the first game. With Batman trying to rebuild society, most of the story surrounds the conflict between the regime trying to rebuild itself, as well as other villain groups reforming in the shadows. But the biggest focus of all is actually Brainiac, and his own attempt of taking over the world. Early on, Brainiac is established to be the guy who destroyed Krypton, kicking off Superman's origin story. Much like the last game, there are several different factions. Gorilla Grodd sets up his group, the Society, which works under Brainiac to do his dirty work. We got Batman expanding his circle of trust and allowing the Flash and Green Lantern to have their own redemption arcs, trying to regain everyone's trust after betraying them to join Superman. 
And then we have Atlantis, which remains neutral until Green Lantern defends it from the society, convincing them to join Batman as they're now sharing a common enemy. But what does this have to do with Superman? Well, after the events of Injustice 1, he finds himself getting put in a jail cell, right alongside all the other captured members of his regime. But as Brainiac's invasion commences, more and more people begin to protest for Superman's freedom, mainly so that he can help with fighting Brainiac. A third of the way through the game, we have Wonder Woman and Black Adam, two of Superman's most valiant supporters, helping by getting him and the rest of the imprisoned regime members out of prison. Helping them is Superman's older cousin, Supergirl, who was deemed as the secret weapon for the remaining regime members. Their plan doesn't fully work out, but Batman allows Superman out anyways, to help him defeat Brainiac with Bruce being unable to come up with any better options. Brainiac meets up with Gorilla Grodd and he learns of Supergirl's existence, leaving our heroes with 48 hours until a full-scale invasion of Earth. Batman brings both parties together to fight against this incoming threat. And after Cyborg and Catwoman break into the Batcave to get the Justice League systems online, it's time to fight against Brainiac. While they initially take a massive L when trying to get through his ship's barrier, with a lot of Metropolis being destroyed yet again, through the power of teamwork, and magic from another world, both Batman and Superman are able to get past the barrier and enter Brainiac's ship. There, they come across Firestorm and Swamp Thing, who have both been brainwashed into serving Brainiac. They're freed, and Brainiac gets defeated by the heroes. But now that the main threat has been taken care of, to the surprise of literally no one, Superman and his gang fight once again to take control of the entire planet. But this time, the forces on Superman and Batman's sides are fighting on equal terms. Batman was prepared for this with him now using a kryptonite-infused Batsuit, and with it, he's able to overcome Superman's powers and win the fight. Canonically, the game ends with Superman being trapped in the Phantom Zone, a place where only the fiercest of villains are left to rot. However, in an alternate ending, you could choose to play as Superman during the final battle, and Superman's forces wind up overthrowing the entire insurgency, throwing Supergirl in a cell and hoping that someday she'll come around and join them. He also turns Batman into a mindless drone, using Brainiac's advanced technology. That way, there's no possibility of Batman ever usurping him again. In Injustice, Superman shows what happens when you don't move on from a tragedy. With him in this constant song and dance of literally trying to take over the world, you'd think that after it doesn't work out the first time, he'd finally quit, but he just doesn't care. If he just actually grieved over Lois Lane, he'd be able to move on, instead of going on this whole vengeance-induced genocide of all villains while he's quite literally becoming one himself. The character of Evil Superman shows why normal Superman's character is so important. The original Superman is someone who exerts a lot of self-control, humility, and empathy, all of which are things you need when you have the level of superpowers that come with being Superman. When you take those morals away, you have someone with a whole lot of power, but without any self-control, and that's what leads him to lose to the original, as well as the more reserved Batman. I guess, in this case, the worst thing you have to fear is yourself. He was right, you know. About what? Put in the same position? I might have done the same thing. We never know what we're truly capable of. Invincible is a really, really good show. The first season dropped on Amazon Prime in March of 2021, and it instantly stole the hearts of many, including myself. While most series have solid main storylines, with several much less important and often goofy side plots, with one season, Invincible manages to keep up several compelling character arcs and storylines all at once with each and every one of them, except one, being equally expanded upon in a way that feels natural, all the while expanding the scope of the world with each and every episode. But a lot of the reason the series got so successful in the first place is because of its villain, Omni-Man. 
His character is incredibly interesting to watch, with his ominous presence taking control over the vast majority of the scenes he appears in. But most importantly, he's the entirety of the reason I, and many others, watched the show in the first place. If you've already seen the show, let me know if this series of events sounds familiar. And if you haven't seen the show, go watch it. Okay. You're online browsing the internet, and you come across a meme of a man telling some dude named Mark to think. It piques your interest. So you look up the scene on YouTube and give it a watch. Without any context, you can tell that it's the most important highlight of the show. It shows a backstory and adds so much substance to a character you've never even gotten familiar with. Then you get an Amazon Prime subscription, even though you've sadly already spoiled the best scene of the whole show, and it's just as incredible once you finally gain some much needed context. The series starts out by showing off the main defenders of the Earth. The Guardians of the Globe. Their main goal is to serve as the primary protectors of Earth if something bad goes down. Their mission here is to defend the White House and protect the President from an attack from these two supervillains, known as the Mahler Twins. The reason it's here is to show the character of the Guardians, as well as their relationships with each other. As you can see with some of their names, Martian Man, War Woman, and Darkwing, these characters aren't exactly original, with the team itself being an obvious stand in for the Justice League. But someone who isn't in the group is this world's version of Superman, Omni-Man. Each and every one of the Guardians have their own personal struggles in their day-to-day -day lives, aside from being superheroes. Most of them have alter egos and have to work on their own personal occupations, as well as saving the world. Red Rush has to balance being a superhero speedster with him having a girlfriend. He perceives time as incredibly slow, so much to the point where a conversation as short as 10 minutes ends up feeling like several hours, and the other Guardians have similar issues. War Woman is the higher up at a major company, and has to deal with the stresses of that, Green Ghost is a photographer, and Martian Man has an E.T.-like friendship with a little girl. They all have their own things outside of hero work, which fleshes them out on a personal level. Then we get to meet our main character. Mark is your average college student. He's got some friends at school, and a job at a restaurant not so creatively called Burger Mart. But the thing that separates Mark from your average kid is the fact that he's the son of none other than Omni-Man himself. One night, he finally unlocks his powers. After accidentally throwing a trash bag into the stratosphere, he tells his parents, Debbie and Nolan, and Nolan offers to teach Mark how to be a true Viltrumite, an alien from another world tasked with keeping the world safe. They start training and things go pretty well. All in all, Omni-Man seems like a pretty nice guy. Oh golly gee willikers, he's killing each and every one of the Guardians! But why? Why is he doing this? Is he mind controlled? This is the first time we get to see the true Omni-Man. Someone who couldn't care less about Earth since it isn't his original planet. As early as the end of episode 1, we're shown this darker side to him. Someone who'd literally killed the entirety of the team consisting of what appeared to be his closest friends and allies. But really, while he had always acted friendly towards them, he was always carrying a dark truth. It turns out that Viltrumites are actually a little bit different than Nolan had led us to believe. They're a species of perfect beings because of selective breeding. Only the most perfect survive, and anyone who couldn't achieve that is killed. The real reason that Omni-Man was sent to the Earth is to single-handedly force it into joining the Viltrumite Empire. And by killing the Guardians, he was able to significantly reduce the Earth's defenses. But to reliably take them all out, it was easier for him to gain their trust and then betray it. The uncovering mystery as to who killed the Guardians is the crux that drives the first half of the season, with us, the audience, already knowing it was Omni-Man, making every scene with him and another character alone incredibly stressful to watch, especially as he and Debbie begin having more and more arguments. This all comes to a head at the end of episode 4, when both Cecil, head of the Global Defense Agency, and a demon detective named Damien Darkblood are well aware that Omni-Man was the one who killed the Guardians. 
And after learning the truth about Omni-Man, explained at the end of the series, it adds a whole extra layer of context to his actions throughout the story. While he succeeds in killing the Guardians, Omni-Man ends up How in critical condition, possible? which leaves Mark in a position where he can finally step up and publicly become his own hero. His first real mission is also a serious crisis. These aliens, called the Flaxians, are invading the Earth. Mark tries his best, but quickly realizes the reality of the danger being a hero brings, and the amount of people he has to watch die. Luckily, Nolan recovers back to near-perfect health. On his way out of the hospital, he very forcefully asks to have his suit back, so that he could hide his bloodied up super suit, stained with the blood of his former colleagues. He then takes care of the Flaxian threat, by going through their portal and destroying their entire planet, but not without saying the line, Earth isn't yours to conquer. Now, this is something Omni-Man says alone, with the only people to hear it being the planet of Flaxians, who don't speak English, and the audience. It's almost like he chose this time to confess to what he plans on doing in the future, as his phrasing implies that he has plans to conquer the Earth, rather than the aliens. The next episode starts off with the funeral and commemoration of the Guardians. On a first time watch, you might think that Nolan genuinely doesn't know what he did. He gives this speech to motivate the remaining heroes, right after murdering the best this world has to offer. But this is just yet another front for his real plan. Over the course of the series, we have third parties like the aforementioned Cecil and demon detective Damien Darkblood investigating the crime, with them piecing together the truth at the end of episode 4. From then on, the question the characters face shifts from who killed the Guardians, to how they go about defeating Omni-Man. At this point, the only people that know the truth are Damien, who's already been sent back to hell, and Cecil and his team, who are currently stumped with what to do. Another reason why I love this show so much is because of how much stuff has been set up with the characters. Damien Darkblood has an insanely cool character concept. He's a demon who's escaped hell, and every case he solves gives him more time to stay on Earth. The show portrays this without a single generic flashback, just with natural conversations he has with Omni-Man and Cecil. Mark ends up meeting Titan, a former villain who is stuck with working for a massive crime boss only known by the name of Machine Head. Another incredibly cool character and one of my favorites. Titan convinces Mark to help him take Machine Head down, but because of an upgrade Titan stole for him earlier on, Machine Head now has the ability to predict the future to nearly perfect accuracy. Accuracy. And paired with his bodyguard, Isotope, having the ability to teleport him out of danger, he's a pretty difficult foe to fight against. Predicting that Titan and Invincible would show up, he was able to pay a ton of money for all sorts of the most deadly and powerful supervillains to defend him. One of those men is an intergalactic warlord known as Battle Beast. Battle Beast beats Mark to near death, after almost killing both Black Samson and Monster Girl two members of the newly recruited second Guardians of the Globe. But as it turns out, Titan was actually able to make a deal with Isotope, convincing him to betray their boss as well, with Titan ending up taking the position as boss for himself. After the premises are secure, Cecil and his men enter the facilities and get a blood sample from Mark, hoping that finding a way to destroy it would also be the answer to defeating Omni-Man when the time comes. After enough time passes, Debbie, Omni-Man's wife and Mark's mom, becomes wise and learns the truth about what happened to the Guardians. But the question of why still lingers. That night, when Nolan comes home, she confronts him about it, leading to the most intimidating moment of the entire show. So knowing that at this point he's been exposed, Omni-Man's first course of action is to meet up with Mark and finally tell him the truth. But before opening up to Mark and explaining why he killed the Guardians, we can see Omni-Man telling himself what he wants to say to Mark. At this moment, there's a rare case of vulnerability. Even though he isn't actually talking to anyone, Omni-Man is showing that he still feels some sort of regret for the pain he's caused. Even if it's for as selfish of a reason as his actions making his mission harder to explain to Mark. While he still cares more about his objective to conquer the Earth, he still cares for Mark too. But before he could explain his mission to Mark, it's time for Cecil and the boys to buy some time so they can get Mark ready to fight Omni-Man. 
They hit him with a bomb, then a laser coming from a satellite, then they put him through a gauntlet featuring a lot of the antagonists we've been seeing throughout the season. He fights cybernetically enhanced soldiers, a genetically enhanced version of a Japanese kaiju, and even the previously dead Guardians member, the Immortal, after he's brought back to life by the Mahler twins. With his immense strength, Omni-Man is able to overcome each and every one of these obstacles, showing minimal damage all the while. His entire fight with Immortal was recorded, with the whole world now being able to see Omni-Man at his worst. Mark witnesses this firsthand after helping Nolan fight the Kaiju. Now we finally made it to the end of the season, with every earlier plot point, no matter how little, being expanded upon and concluded, while also bringing up plenty of points to expand upon for the next season. In the 8th and final episode, Where I Really Come From, we get to follow Mark as he steps forward and finally confronts his father. The battle is intense. Straight off the bat, it's made very clear that Nolan always had the upper hand. And once the fight really kicks off, well, let's just say there's a reason that the title text gets progressively bloodier as the series continues. For most of it, there isn't even an actual fight being had. It's just Nolan forcing his son to watch people die in a vain attempt to get Mark to understand that human life is meaningless. This fight makes you lose all sympathy for Omni-Man's character. Even after killing the Guardians, while he was still threatening at times, he was generally a kind figure, but with this fight, he's no longer a secondary main character, but instead, a full-blown evil supervillain. And once he's done holding back, Omni-Man beats Mark to a bloody pulp with full intent to kill. Throughout this series, Invincible gets the life beat out of him time and time again, with each and every interaction leaving him closer and closer to death. And this time, it's no different. During the bludgeoning, we get a flashback to a baseball game taking place during Mark's childhood, where we can see Nolan and Debbie watching a young Mark play the game. Nolan remarks that watching the game is pointless, a waste of everyone's time. But as they continue watching, Debbie gives him a little lesson about being a parent. Mark hits a home run, which makes Nolan feel genuinely proud of his son. It's a touching moment, and when intercut with the present, it creates such a dramatic parallel. But more importantly, it gives us a much needed break from the beatdown to remind us, and Omni-Man, that, like it or not, he's still fallen victim to the same human emotions as everybody else. It's incredible, really. With this one scene, Omni-Man doesn't only regain what makes him so fun as a character, but it also adds a whole other layer of personality to him. Never have I ever had a series hurl me down a roller coaster of emotions in the way that this finale did. And it isn't over yet. Omni-Man continues to desperately point out how everything in Mark's current life will be but a fraction of the past, as he'll go on to live for thousands more years to come. Then he finally hits Mark with the ultimate question. What will you have after 500 years? To which Mark responds, Are you that? I still have you. This is the thing that makes Nolan realize, even though Mark is fighting with him, that he still cares dearly for him. This makes Nolan snap back to reality, and he realizes what he's done, and what he's about to do. Nolan takes off, not being able to kill his one and only son. As a character, Omni-Man was specifically designed to look both friendly and intimidating depending on the situation, or what part of the story we happen to be in. By the latter half of the series, every interaction Nolan has keeps you on the edge of your seat with suspense, even when he's not necessarily planning to do anything. The showrunners really know what they're doing when it comes to character deaths as well. It knows exactly which characters to kill off and which characters get to survive for the next season. It knows when you want someone to survive and when the character is unimportant enough that they can afford to kill them off. The show plays around with this constantly. As the main character, Mark has automatic plot armor because, well, he's the main character of the show. No matter how many times he gets his ass kicked, you know he's gonna get back up, because he's invincible. But for every side character, except her, you actively fear and pray for their lives, since there's no guarantee that they're gonna get more screen time and development. They don't want to waste the potential from a single character. <laughs> Even though the Guardians die early on, we get to learn more about them through those who survive. 
Omni-Man isn't necessarily just an evil Superman. He has several elements that make him more fleshed out than just a pure evil tyrant. The Viltrumite code of operations does make a fair amount of sense, but you can still root against him for it. Seeing his choice to spare Mark at the end of the season possibly shows an important turning point in his character, showing that, for once, he finally cares for the life of his son over the duties he's received from his fellow Viltrumites. And I'm sure more interesting things are coming up in seasons 2 and 3. I'm happy Invincible is getting the attention and credit that it truly deserves, and I'm very excited for the second season, and how it'll expand on the characters. But for now, while we wait for more Invincible, let's look at another series that's also on Amazon Prime. The Boys takes place in a pretty standard reality. Technology is a tad more advanced, but besides that, the biggest difference is the existence of real-life superheroes. But in this series, I think they're a little too real. The most popular superheroes are owned by a monopolistic company that sucks out all the morals most superheroes would stand for. You could really tell that the world of the boys was crafted by a man who has a serious hatred towards superheroes. And that man is Garth Ennis. His idea was to create a comic that takes place in a world where superheroes are corrupt controlled by the corporate overlords above them. And in this world, there's no hero as corrupt, egotistical, and corporate as Homelander. Being the face of the Seven, the most popular superhero group on the planet, Homelander is known for being the face of Vought International, the biggest superhero company. He's seen as the perfect being, a god, all the while still being the marketable face of the group. But underneath this perfect facade, he's the most flawed and evil character in the entire show. And he takes the role of, you guessed it, Superman. But to get into why Homelander is evil, we first have to talk about the company, Vought. Vought was founded in 1939 by Nazi physician Frederick Vought. He used unethical means on Jewish prisoners to develop Compound V, a drug that gives people superhuman abilities. Homelander's story starts right where every American-made hero comes from. A cold, uncaring lab full of doctors and scientists. He was created using the genes of, publicly, the first and greatest superhero, Soldier Boy. No, not Soldier Boy, creator of the highly esteemed Soldier game console, Soldier Boy. <clears throat> Throughout Homelander's childhood, he was put through a slew of experiments, surgeries, and tests, all done with the intention of seeing just how far his powers go. He was also subject to extreme brainwashing, to hammer in the American ideals of the flag, Catholicism, and baseball. All of which would end up being the American ideals included in his origin story. In his fake backstory, he had a loving mom and dad, played baseball, and painted miniature airplanes. All of those things are lies, crafted solely for the sake of marketing, with even something as basic as his birthday being changed to July 4th to be more patriotic. When The Homelander was added as the newest member of the Seven, he ended up accidentally being upstaged by Black Noir, who was, at the time, the most popular superhero of the group. This gave Homelander a negative first impression of him, made even worse by Madeline Stilwell telling him that Black Noir is there to make sure he isn't stepping out of line. For his first mission, Homelander, as well as Black Noir, are tasked with defusing a hostage situation involving a group of violent protesters called the Chemical Liberation Front. Not wanting to get overshadowed by Black Noir, he enters the facility 10 minutes early, 
and he succeeds in non-lethally restraining several of the captors. He makes his way to the leaders of the operation in the main control room. The group's leader begins to open fire on him, but he uses his super speed to take all their guns and tie them up into a knot. One of the men grabs his gun anyways, and continues to threaten the hostage, knowing that pulling the trigger will make the gun explode, causing the death of both him and the hostage. Homelander thinks he knows how to one-up him, by using his laser sight to destroy the gun he was holding. But something he didn't expect was the gun self-destructing anyways, killing the hostage and exploding the criminal's hand clean off. A notable difference between early Homelander and the more modern one is that he had a naive sense of optimism towards his heroics. He had no idea how bloody it would be, and while he went in expecting to beat up bad guys and save the day, he only realized then that the world wasn't as black and white. It was never his intention to kill anyone, but something he learns is that it also wasn't planned for the protesters. He's berated with comments from them, saying that the death of the hostage was all his fault. And this causes him to get flashbacks about his abusive life in the lab. And he snaps, and kills the woman calling him out, after ripping her jaw clean off, killing her. Then he experienced a second, more intense wave of flashbacks. When he comes to, every person in the room is dead, aside from one woman. Black Noir witnesses this, and thinking that he's gonna get ratted on and removed from the Seven, he uses his laser eyes to tear the whole building to the ground. But, as it turns out, Black Noir was never planning to rat Homelander out. He snaps the remaining woman's neck to cover up Homelander's misdeeds, and he pulls out a notepad and writes something on it. Something to the extent of, I'm not your enemy, I'm your ally or any sort of phrasing along those lines. Presumably, he also may have given Homelander some advice relating to PR, as the next time we see him, he's telling the press that a non-existent bomb went off, and that the people are the real heroes, a line of phrasing that only becomes more common as you watch through the series. Speaking of, the boys series follows the stories of two people, Huey Campbell and Annie January, better known in the Seven as Starlight. Huey is just your average guy in a world where there are soups aplenty. He has a girlfriend named Robin that he was about to move in with until Mr. A-Train just walks through her like a verified gamer. Huey is devastated by this, and this, as well as him meeting one Billy Butcher, he ends up joining the boys a group of criminals with the goal of taking down Vought and the Seven. At the same time, Annie achieves her dream, and joins the highest caliber of superhero stardom, only to realize how cold and corporate Vought and the superhero industry really is. By the beginning of the series, Homelander is already the leader of the Seven, and according to Billy Butcher in the first episode, Homelander doesn't do drugs or drink alcohol. That's because he's on a much more addictive drug attention. Whatever Homelander does, it's always with the sole interest in getting the public to like him. Even his most iconic actions, his speeches that call the people the real heroes, are used as damage control so often because it was always the most effective method for getting people to like him by the end of things, regardless of his mistakes. Later on, he and fellow Seven member and ex-girlfriend, Queen Maeve, are tasked with stopping a plane that was hijacked by Tit. <clears throat> violent protesters. This could very well be the most important mission Homelander could be on at this point. Vought's main goal at the moment is to convince the Senate to make it legal for their soups to fight in the armed forces, which would undoubtedly give them a good chunk of that American military budget, as well as increase their already massive influence. So it's imperative that they get this done successfully, with minimal or no hitches. We're having yet another hostage situation, something that we've already established Homelander doesn't exactly specialize in. Homelander opens the plane's door from the outside, and one of the armed protesters fly out of the plane and to their apparent deaths in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Queen Maeve enters and takes out another one. Homelander uses his eye beams to take out what's assumed to be the last one. Then he starts to calm the hostages down, and he takes control of the situation. But then, Queen Maeve checks the door to the pilot's cockpit, and it's locked. She and Homelander break down the door, and there's one more guy in there. 
and before he could be calmed down, he shoots the pilot. Much like what happened in the power plant with the Chemical Liberation Front, Homelander once again uses his heat vision to kill one of the protesters, without thinking about the environment he's damaging, causing accidental damage to the plane's controls. The plane isn't gonna be in the air for much longer, and Homelander isn't in a position where he can save everyone, since he's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, so they leave, and let 123 innocent and people fall to their deaths. But this doesn't impede on Vought's plans. It doesn't even put Homelander in a compromising position. Instead, he uses the method taught to him by Black Noir, and he comes up with a realistic, ulterior timeline of events. One that portrays himself in a much better light, turning his greatest failures into his greatest moments. Everyone loves a good speech, a pep talk to keep people fighting. In this case, fighting for soups to be partnered with the government. As the rest of the season goes by, the boys continue to make gradual but important progress on taking down Vought. Huey and Annie meet up and start dating, the boys kill Translucent, and Huey even blackmails this Christian soup Ezekiel into giving him info. But throughout all this time, Homelander continues to get intel on the boys, gradually getting closer and closer to their whereabouts as they make their progress. This all comes to a head in the seventh episode. Homelander calls a meeting with the five remaining members of the Seven, as the Deep was outed for doing something not very great without consent and Translucent was, well, killed. He brings up that Starlight was the one who allowed Huey to meet up with another soup to keep his plan moving forward, and he uses that to call out Starlight for helping Huey get in. The entire scene, as well as any other time we see Homelander mildly upset, is insanely suspenseful. You never know when or if he'll snap and kill someone off. It's incredibly stressful, a lot like Invincible. While both Omni-Man and Homelander have these ominous presences, they also both have weaknesses, in the form of their reputations. Or rather, they had weaknesses. By the end of Invincible, Omni-Man went completely mask off about his motives. That's something that'll never happen with Homelander, so long as he cares about the opinions others hold of him. While he can still kill anyone in the world, the only real thing Homelander values is other people's perception of him. But obviously, the opinions of some people are more important than the opinions of others. That brings us to Mr. Stanford Edgar. Mr. Mr. Edgar is the CEO of Vaught International, and he's one of the very few people, like Billy Butcher, to show no sense of fear towards Homelander, even being able to intimidate him at times. Because, again, he shows absolutely no fear towards the imposing presence this superhuman with godlike abilities possesses. His heart rate doesn't even have the slightest increase. In a world full of superheroes, you might start to wonder why there aren't any super villains. Well, since Vought uses Compound V to get the heroes themselves, there isn't any other way to get superpowers. That was, until now. It turns out that, one way or another, Compound V ended up in the hands of those armed protesters. This is awfully convenient for Vought, as this just so happened to be the time when they really needed a reason for soups in the military. And with this new rise in villains making nuclear combat irrelevant, there doesn't seem to be another option. After it's discovered that these guys have a sash of Compound V for themselves, Homelander goes to Syria to deal with them. But here's the thing, Homelander was actually the one responsible for giving them the V. He tells this to his higher up, Madeline Stilwell, and she's impressed. But then later that night, she has a special guest show up at her house, Billy Butcher. But why does Billy hate Homelander so much? Well, he did something bad with Billy's wife without consent and then she disappeared. Billy breaks into Madeline's home and ties her up, placing 30 pounds of C4 all around her. Homelander arrives at her house, and they start talking. Billy didn't really have a well thought out plan for killing Homelander, and he really just wanted to hurt Homelander the way he did to Billy. Homelander responds by asking Billy if he has any actual proof that he killed his wife, to which Billy doesn't say anything. Homelander reveals that he knows the real truth, that Stillwell lied to him about some of the finer details. 
so he uses his heat vision to laser right through her eyes and head. This is the first of many turning points in this roller coaster of a character. He kills her off knowing that he cares for her. That way, he doesn't have to worry about Stillwell being used to force him into submission. Not to mention, she also lied to him. And as you'll soon come to see, there's nothing Homelander hates more than liars. With his leverage being turned into a victim of the world's most dangerous staring contest, Billy detonates the explosives. Then, he wakes up at the home of his wife and her kid. Yeah, so it turns out that the woman Homelander did stuff to gave him a child, and Homelander brought Butcher to see his wife still alive, alongside the son she had with Homelander. Homelander could have just killed Billy, but instead, he gave him a new source of motivation for his undying hatred towards Homelander. The next time we see him, Homelander is the head of Translucent's funeral. He makes the excuse that Translucent was killed by one of those foreign supervillains, and right after he he's done, Ashley, Stillwell's replacement, found a new hero to replace Translucent. His name is Blindspot. While he may lack the gift of sight, he actually has super hearing. And when paired with his existing gift of acrobatics, he's really a force to be reckoned with. Oh god damn it, Homelander, now he's blind and deaf! But someone actually was able to join the Seven. She was invited straight from Mr. Edgar himself. Her name is Stormfront. Homelander isn't exactly happy about the new addition joining the group without warning him ahead of time, so he meets up with Mr. Edgar. He starts smugly considering his options when Edgar changes the subject to Vought's founder. He explains the story of Vought's founding to Homelander, then points out something pretty important. You are under a misconception that we are a superhero company. We are not. What we are, really, is a pharmaceutical company. And you are not our most valuable asset. Then he goes on to point out that the little stunt Homelander pulled has the risk of jeopardizing the entire company. With one short monologue, Edgar was able to give a lecture straight to Homelander, showing no fear all the while, and even intimidating Homelander himself. He retreats from the conversation and goes to his son's house to get his mind off things. So the very next day, Homelander is ready to show Ryan that he has powers. He pushes him off the roof for him to take flight. Oh, that's not good. So that doesn't work. But after getting into an altercation with the boy's mother, he uses his newly found laser eyes to protect her. Heading back to Vought headquarters, Compound V just got exposed to the public. Uh-oh. Well, at least Homelander's back at the base. He gets payback on Edgar for his lecture, with Edgar now being the one chewed out in front of the Seven. Homelander says that Vought doesn't matter because the talent could just go to a different company or be on their own. While this is all happening, the boys are investigating the newly established supervillains. This comes to a head when the Seven confront the boys in a storm drain. After trying and failing to get Starlight to kill Huey, the two super-powered T-words escape to the surface, where Stormfront beats and kills one of them, while also making sure to kill as many people of color as possible, because Stormfront is actually a Nazi. Like, no joke, she was actually the wife of Frederick Vaught himself, and she's also the recipient of the very first successful dosage of Compound V, and she carried all of those 1930s ideals into the modern day. Mr. Edgar holds a press conference about the Compound V League, as well as the attack that was protected by Stormfront, and he even gets her to give one of Homelander's classic You're the Real Heroes speeches. Homelander feels like he's losing power within the Seven. He threatens Starlight, kicks A-Train out of the group, and he takes advantage of Queen Maeve by corporatizing the fact that she's bisexual, marketing it as just her being gay. gay. But his efforts still end up going to waste, as a video surfaces showing Homelander fighting one of the supervillains overseas. He used his laser to kill the man, then fly away, but what he didn't realize is that he had accidentally killed an innocent teenage bystander who was hiding behind a tarp. This video angers the masses, and a large protest ensues to fight against Homelander's right to remain in the military after his war crime. He shows up to the protest himself, 
ignoring Ashley's wishes, and he gives another one of his classic speeches to the public. But this time, it doesn't work out like you'd expect. After he tries to calm down the crowd and he talks about his experience in the military, a soldier begins a chant, you don't speak for us, and the whole crowd joins in. After imagining himself burning that crowd to bits, he retreats by flying away. So after that whole catastrophe, Homelander meets up with Stormfront in an attempt to rebuild his reputation. She shows off some of the memes they made to artificially sway the public opinion back in Homelander's favor, and he appreciates that, and the two start dating. After a while, they eventually get to the point where he feels comfortable enough to show Stormfront his son. While they're over there, they try to get Ryan away from his mother. He convinces Ryan to leave with him, despite his mother's wishes, by showing Ryan that his surroundings are actually not real. And there's more to the world than his mom had led him to believe. At Vought Tower, Ryan quickly begins to miss his mother. Homelander and Stormfront take him out and try to get him to practice using his powers. They try to get him to think about someone he hates, but he doesn't actually hate anyone because he doesn't know anyone to hate. Then Stormfront starts trying to red pill him with racist ideals, but it's quickly interrupted when she starts getting notification after notification. The boys, now with Starlight on their side, leaked a whole ton of dirt on mainly about her being a hundred-year-old Nazi and the former wife of Frederick Vought. A ton of Vought-branded speakers then start to make an awful ear-piercing noise, which lures Homelander and his super hearing away. The boys are here to take back Ryan, but as they're driving away, Stormfront comes back and fighting ensues. We have Stormfront fighting against Starlight and Kimiko, a woman the boys found in a Compound V testing facility, and someone who isn't exactly fond of Stormfront after she killed her brother, and with a little help from Queen Maeve, who shows up completely unexpectedly, they're able to force Stormfront into retreating. She heads to a fleeing Butcher, Rebecca, and Ryan, and she almost kills Becca, until Becca's son lasers Stormfront into a melted mass. He also accidentally kills his mom too, whoops. So then Homelander finally shows up. Homelander's about to absolutely decimate Butcher and Ryan, but Queen Maeve once again saves the day by threatening to release the video of the plane going down from all that time ago. She uses Homelander's wish to be loved by everyone against him, which forces him to let them go. And after Stormfront's little expose, Homelander's reputation is worse than ever. He goes on a ton of news shows, always giving the exact same speech saying that he happened to fall in love with the wrong woman, and because of this, Edgar gets the idea to take some power away from Homelander, and make Starlight the co-captain of the team. With Edgar even giving her permission to choose who fills in the two empty seats at the Seven, Homelander is pretty upset at that, but there's nothing he could do, since Mr. Edgar holds so much power over the company, and by extension, him. Then he visits Stormfront. They have a nice conversation that quickly gets ruined after she starts talking about the master race and speaking German, weirding out Homelander and getting him to leave. Later that night, Homelander goes to the place Billy's staying at, making an agreement that someday, the two of them will fight to the death. Then, he disappears into the night, without making a sound. The next day is Homelander's birthday, and he goes back to Stormfront to get her to wish him a happy birthday, but she doesn't even respond to him. Later on, he tries to stop a girl named Chelsea from jumping off a building. He explains that her jumping wouldn't really matter because he could always just catch her anyways. But then he sees on a nearby building, a news clip saying that Stormfront took her own life on his birthday. He rants to Chelsea, comparing himself to Jesus and saying that he's a god. Chelsea has a change of heart, deciding that she no longer wants to jump, but Homelander has a change of heart for himself. He forces her to jump off the building and to her death. That night, the people at Vought started the Homelander's birthday extravaganza, until a man in the audience starts to point out how his Nazi girlfriend died, obviously relating to Stormfront's death earlier that day. Starlight quickly covers for him, pointing out that everybody makes mistakes, but then Homelander interrupts her and he gives a speech. But this isn't his usual type of speech, 
where he apologizes and goes, you're the real heroes. No, this speech is about his superiority over everybody else. He allows his ego and narcissism to finally, publicly come to the surface, and he reminds everyone about how powerful he really is. This marks yet another important turning point in Homelander's character. He's no longer pretending to be someone he isn't. He's telling the truth to the whole world, though, in a twisted way. Starlight wants to include a Muslim woman into the Seven, but Homelander can't have that. Once again, a video of the Flight 37 incident is used to threaten him, but he doesn't care. It no longer matters if he gets exposed for the airplane incident, because once he loses everything, he has nothing to lose. This makes Homelander an even more terrifying antagonist than ever, because, in his own words, Well then I would have to say that you have absolutely no leverage, because I am the Homelander. Victoria Newman, director of the Federal Bureau of Superhuman Affairs and the adopted daughter of Mr. Stan Edgar, gets contacted by Mr. Edgar and he tells her to do a press conference about Homelander's crimes. But things don't turn out quite as expected. Instead of forcing Homelander to abide by the law and answer for his crimes, she instead praises him as a hero for whistleblowing on Edgar's misdeeds. And with Mr. Edgar out of the picture, Homelander now has the means to run Vought for himself, and everyone who used Edgar for protection is no longer protected. But also, Homelander now has no one to cover for him when he makes any more mistakes. With Vought now under Homelander's command, he fires any employees that have ever said anything negative about him, claiming that he only wants team players. And because of this constant longing to be number one, he decided that he'd be the head of the company instead of getting other, more experienced people to do the business stuff for him. A few days later, Footage of a man unleashing a giant laser beam from his chest shocks the public. The man on the TV is none other than Soldier Boy. Not Soldier Boy. Soldier Boy, who's often regarded as the greatest hero who's ever lived. He was locked in a Russian testing facility for the past 45 years, and had just recently been freed by the boys. But because Homelander's too busy with company work, he sends out Starlight to go look for him instead. Then he holds a private meeting with Queen Maeve. He asks her if she had ever actually cared for him during their relationship. And she responds with, From the start, I hated you. Black Noir then comes from behind and takes her to an unknown location. Soldier Boy then has a similar conversation at his ex-lover, Crimson Countess's house. He asks her how much money the Russians had paid for him to be turned in and experimented on, and it turns out that they weren't paid at all. He tells Crimson that he loved her, to which she replied, I didn't love you. I hated you. A neat parallel between the stories of Soldier Boy and the man who was created as a clone of him. The Crime Analysis Department, which is run by The Deep and him alone, because he fired everyone else, tracks down the perpetrator of the laser blast. And once he's in costume and shaved, Homelander immediately recognizes him as Soldier Boy. The next day, The Deep informs Homelander that Black Noir ran off. That shakes Homelander to his core, and results in some serious self-doubt. Throughout the series, Black Noir has shown zero emotion towards anything outside of one time. So if Soldier Boy just reappearing got him scared enough to run away, then that says a whole lot about who Homelander's about to be dealing with. They meet up at the inside of the now-destroyed house of the TNT Twins, two former members of Payback, the team Soldier Boy used to operate, and they have a showdown. They exchange some tough blows, but it looks like Homelander's gonna take it here. But in the nick of time, Butcher shows up with his temporary compound V drugs, and he and Soldier Boy work together to fight against Homelander. But sadly, he escapes at the last second. But even though he's not dead, he still got bruised. This is the first time in the entire series where Homelander's had any form of physical damage after a fight, and now he still has to deal with the revelation that he can still die. One night, Homelander receives a call from Soldier Boy. He says that he's found out Homelander is his son, made in a lab from his own DNA. 
He says that had he known that sooner, he'd have wanted his own son to have the spotlight more than anything else. The next morning, Black Noir comes back to the base. While Black Noir sharpens his sword, Homelander comes up and asks what his father was like leading his old team. Noir doesn't exactly give all too positive of an answer, insisting that Soldier Boy must be killed. And it's revealed that Noir knew that Homelander had a father throughout all this time, and purposely kept the truth from him. Homelander responds by punching a hole straight through Black Noir's chest. After all this time, Soldier Boy makes it to Vought Tower. They're about to fight when Homelander shows Soldier Boy his grandson, showing that Homelander isn't Soldier Boy's only living family member. While he seems to be responding positively to it at first, we quickly find out that he really thinks Homelander's weak and pathetic. It's a full brawl at this point. Butcher vs. Soldier Boy, and Homelander vs. Queen Maeve. Soldier Boy almost kills Butcher only to be saved by Starlight, who, with the help of Huey lighting up the entire room, is able to harness that energy to blast Soldier Boy with enough power to knock him to his knees. And the rest of the boys get him to breathe in the most powerful nerve agent the Russians had ever concocted. With no other options, Soldier Boy's final plan is to send out the most damaging laser of them all, with the intentions of taking everyone else out with him. But with one final sacrifice from Queen Maeve, losing her powers as a side effect of getting hit by the blast, she tackles him through a window, and he self-destructs outside the tower, saving everyone inside. Ryan leaves with Homelander, Butcher becomes terminally ill because of the drugs, Maeve can finally spend the rest of her days powerless and happy, Starlight finally joins the boys for good this time, Homelander reveals Ryan to the world, and Soldier Boy is put back into cryogenic sleep. As humanity continues to wait for the day that a method of actually killing soups of his power somehow arises. Homelander is the superhero equivalent of a soulless corporation, even becoming the CEO of Vought himself. While he had started out with some semblance of compassion or humility, he quickly became the emotionless machine that the doctors in the lab wanted him to be. Since the beginning, every time he causes something bad to happen, he speaks like a lawyer or a politician, or at least he did. Regardless of what Mr. Edgar thought before, Homelander is the face of the company. Homelander is Vought. With Compound V being public knowledge, Homelander is the product. Ironically enough, all of the full-on criminal murderers known as the boys are still morally in the right when opposed to most of the heroes at Vought. If anything, the soups have killed more innocent people than anyone else. They've killed so many criminals that it doesn't even phase them when they kill someone who isn't one. Homelander embodies everything wrong with the corporate superheroes depicted in this series. He's the exact antithesis of Omni-Man. While the characters are similar at first glance, Nolan's motives are at least for the greater goals that his species are striving for. Each and every one of Homelander's actions are to benefit one person, himself. Anything he does that seemingly benefits someone else always has some sort of ulterior motive to benefit him. His reputation, his position in the Seven, his wins. Everything that happens has to revolve around him. I guess that's what happens when you're born with so much power no one can oppose you. I am curious. What did you give her? A little respect, Stan. Now you respect me because I'm a threat. <laughs> I don't need you. Now, there's actually a pretty good reason I'll be covering both of these villains at the same time. These are two different movies, released by two different studios, published in two different decades. But they both share similarities with their most villainous characters. They both start one way, then change into another as the story progresses. Megamind is a bad guy gone good, and Syndrome is a good guy gone bad. Let's start with Syndrome. Buddy Pine started out as a brilliant young mind and a super fan of Mr. Incredible, being his number one fan and the head of his fan club. Even though he never had any powers of his own, he wanted to join his favorite super in keeping the city safe. But Mr. Incredible, being a rational thinker, didn't want some kid with no powers putting his life at risk. 
rejecting Buddy from becoming his sidekick. In a typical story, Buddy would be the protagonist. He's an underdog who just can't seem to get his way, no matter how hard he tries to overcome the hurdle of him not having any powers. But instead, things go in a completely different direction. Even early on, Incrediboy had a high enough intellect and a knowledge of mechanical engineering to build rocket boots and other gadgets when he showed up to fight Bomb Voyage with Mr. Incredible. Demonstrating that, despite him having a lack of powers, he could create gadgets to substitute that. But Mr. Incredible wasn't having any of it. He actually had to let Bomb Voyage go in order to ensure the safety of Buddy, turning him into the police and telling the officers to take him to his mother. With that, Buddy's perception of Mr. Incredible had been shattered beyond repair. All of his idolizing and worshipping has all turned into hatred. 15 years go by, and Buddy's doing pretty well for himself. Despite being rejected by Mr. Incredible, he's able to use his gifts to make some good money as a weapon designer. But that hatred for Mr. Incredible never faded away. Buddy wanted revenge. So he constructs a series of robots called the Omnidroids, a robot spider thing that uses AI to learn and overcome any obstacle it faces. He uses his agent, Mirage, to send several supers to fight the robot, lying to them, saying that it got out of hand in order to make the heroes fight it. Any heroes that fought the Omnidroid would end up dead, and those that lived wouldn't by the next iteration of the robot. After killing enough supers, Buddy thinks it's ready to take on Mr. Incredible. But to Syndrome's surprise, he's actually able to destroy the robot by outsmarting it, using the robot's powerful arms to damage what was thought to be its impenetrable skin. Buddy gets back to work, making some adjustments and improvements for it to completely cover Mr. Incredible's options the next time they fight. And it does exactly that. The Omnidroid 9.0 wipes the floor with Mr. Incredible, and Buddy comes out and starts monologuing. Then he shows off his Zero Point Energy Gmod Gravity Gun laser thing, and this shows that Syndrome saves the best gadgets for himself. Because of his own incompetence, Mr. Incredible is able to escape, hiding behind the skeletal remains of one of his old hero friends, Gazer Beam. The last thing that Gazer did before dying was using his laser eyes to write Kronos into the cave, which turns out to be the password for Syndrome's computer, as well as the name of the operation he's running. Mr. Incredible gets captured after his suit sends out a homing signal after Elastigirl remotely activates it, suspecting him of cheating on her. The rest of his family is presumed dead after their jet gets blown up with Syndrome's rocket, and Mr. Incredible is at his lowest point. But Syndrome, still being a toxic fanboy at heart, criticizes his old idol for being lame and sending out a homing signal asking for help, then rubbing in the fact that Mr. Incredible claimed he worked better alone, further aggravating him. But as it turns out, Mr. Incredible's family survives, making their way to the island, and even managing to help the man himself escape from his imprisonment, with some help from Mirage. But after yet another battle against Syndrome's forces, they all end up with Syndrome's BS gravity gun pause button. So now he's got the whole family captured, and he explains his plan. He's gonna save the city from a robot he has complete control over, tricking everyone into praising him as a real superhero. And he'll give everyone the most spectacular heroics anyone's ever seen. Once the Omnidroid makes it to the city, it's time for Buddy to make his grand reveal as a super. And while things start out pretty good, it's only a matter of time until the Omnidroid starts to realize what's going on, and it shoots a laser at the remote Syndrome was using to control it, making the robot go out of Syndrome's control. Syndrome's entire image as a super was built on top of a lie, and he has nothing to fall back on in terms of actual heroics or morals. He was more concerned with propping himself up as a hero, 
rather than having the abilities to back it up. As soon as the robot was out of Syndrome's control, he flew away and knocked himself out, leaving the Incredibles and Frozone to swoop in and do the dirty work, saving the day by, once again, using the Omnidroid's own unstoppable power against it. But Syndrome isn't done yet. His final act of evil is to go to the Par residence and try to take Mr. Incredibles' child, Jack-Jack, away from him and the rest of the family. But luckily for everyone, Jack-Jack actually ends up having every every power in the book, so he ends up beating up Syndrome himself. His journey ends with his cape getting stuck in a jet turbine, pulling him in and killing him. No capes. The lesson learned from Syndrome's story is to never meet your heroes. When you put anyone on such a high pedestal, it's only a matter of time until that perception breaks. Buddy started out as Mr. Incredible's number one fan, but over time, he became his greatest nemesis. The Incredibles isn't a movie made for little kids. It has themes about the morals of saving people from themselves, living past your prime, love affairs, and a ton of other mature themes. But it can also function as a silly little superhero movie for six-year-old me. No! No! Stop! Please! Don't leave me here! Mr. Mr. While he doesn't have superpowers, Syndrome is here because of his sheer malignancy and drive to see horrible things happen to the man he hates the most. The man he used to idolize, Mr. Incredible. And in some ways, that even makes him more deserving. Megamind is a very similar character. His story starts with the typical Superman backstory of his planet being destroyed, and he was placed in a pod that safely took him to Earth. He landed in a prison where he was raised, taught to believe that crime is good and the law is bad. While he's good-natured, he was always shunned by the society around him, leaving him isolated. While he tries to help his situation by using machines he builds all on his own, those often backfire, alienating him from his peers even more. And at the same time he was being shunned, his soon-to-be arch-nemesis, Metro Man, continued to gain the undying support of those around him. Cut to present day, and Metro Man is the hero of Metrocity, a uh, Metro City. He fights with Megamind regularly, and they have a pretty typical hero-villain dynamic. Megamind does something evil, and Metro Man stops him. All the while, they partake in a playful banter. That is, until the day Megamind finally wins. Metro Man gets hit with a solar-powered Mega Death Ray, and he's declared dead. Megamind then gets free reign to do whatever he wants. He rocks robs banks, overtakes Town Hall, and just has a roaring time doing so. But after a while, everything seems to get stale. After achieving his lifelong dream, there are no more dreams to be achieved. He falls into a depressive state, but while attempting to create a new hero he can fight against, he accidentally creates a bigger threat than himself, someone we'll go into detail about later. Through the events of the rest of the movie, Megamind is able to take on this greater threat, and he even finds a new sense of purpose as Metro City's new defender. He's the bad guy gone good. He even meets Metro Man later on. Yeah, it turns out that he's still alive, he just wanted to quit being the defender of Metro City, as it was a role he never asked to carry. It was just the one that was given to him by the people around him. But Megamind actually wanted it, so achieving that goal actually gave Megamind some long-lasting fulfillment. Megamind shares a lot of his abilities with Syndrome. They're both basically powerless, but have been blessed with the intelligence to create weapons to destroy their nemeses. Syndrome has Mirage, Megamind has Minion. Syndrome has an island base, Megamind has the fake observatory. They're pretty much identical, aside from one major difference. Where they come from, and where they end up. Syndrome started out as an enthusiastic but naive hero, only to turn into a villain. And Megamind starts out by being raised by the inmates in a prison to be a villain, but he ends up becoming a hero at the end of things regardless. So why am I going about both of these characters instead of just one? Well, I absolutely love both of these movies, but more specifically, I don't just want to talk about Megamind, as there's someone in this movie who fits the role as an evil Superman even better. Titan is everything that a hero shouldn't be. He's a selfish, creepy incel, only motivated by the idea of him getting the girl. 
And when that doesn't happen, he immediately switches sides. This guy sucks. But before we get into detail about Titan, we first have to talk about where he came from. On the same night Megamind's planet was going to be destroyed, so was another planet close by. And it looks like the other planet had an escape pod of their own. Metro Man also landed on Earth, but instead of landing in a prison like Megamind, he instead landed in a rich household, with parents that were financially wealthy enough to let him do whatever he wanted. This, obviously, made him pretty spoiled and gave him a massive ego. So later on, after Megamind killed him and he felt sad about not having a purpose, he decided to create a successor using Metro Man's DNA. Through an unfortunate coincidence, he accidentally gives this power to Hal Stewart, someone who doesn't deserve this power, to say the least. Regardless, Megamind decides to train him to be a hero anyways, using a disguise pretending to be his space dad. After some training, Megamind finally gives him his suit, and his superhero name, Titan. But after he fails to make a good impression by <clears throat> saving her from falling, Roxanne actually ends up more scared of him than anything else. Instead of fighting Megamind, Titan insists on the two teaming up, new costume designs and all. Megamind reveals that he was actually actually the one pretending to be Hal's space dad, and further antagonizes him. This starts a battle, and much like the fight between Invincible and Omni-Man, you could really see Megamind's experience with fighting Metro Man. But Titan's rage and superpowers gets the best of him, and Megamind has to flee in order to not get lasered to death. Titan takes advantage of his absence by taking over the city, even using his laser eyes to rename the city Titanville, named after himself, of course. But the word Titan is spelled differently now. Titan, T-I-T-A-N, represents the ideal superhero Megamind wanted him to be. But Titan, T-I-G-H-T-E-N, represents the villain he ended up becoming. But all the flaws in his character were always present. The powers didn't corrupt him or turn him into this. No, he was always like that. The powers are just the tool that gave him the leverage to act the way he was always wanting to. Titan is a full-on tyrant, taking over Metro City and completely destroying it in the process. He only became a hero because he was promised to get the girl. Much like Syndrome, he doesn't have any actual care for the heroics. Megamind goes back to his jail cell after giving up, but Titan feels that they had some unfinished business. He kidnaps Roxanne, planning to take her life while destroying the city. But Megamind shows up in the nick of time, using his brain bots and dehydration ray to make up for his lack of powers. But it isn't enough and he ends up injured. Titan attempts to finally kill Roxanne, but then Metro Man returns, and Titan gets scared off and never shows his face again, until he does less than a minute later. During their little flying chase, Metro Man calls Metro City Metrocity, and the only person who pronounces it like that is Megamind. This little blunder jeopardizes his entire plan. Then it's revealed that Metro Man actually never I'm left done. hiding, and the guy we thought was Megamind was actually Minion. Titan throws Megamind into the air, and he falls. This is but after some quick thinking, he's able to outsmart Hal and turn him back into his fat loser cell. Titan is a good example of what happens when you give an unideal host superpowers. The superpowers just amplify your negative traits. And with a character like Hal, the negative traits are all that shine through. Each and every one of the characters in this video have a unique and distinct way of making an evil version of Superman. And I threw in some other characters too. Villainy can be portrayed in a wide variety of different forms. Whether it's taken more seriously or used as a joke, how threatening the characters become over the course of the story, and most importantly, above all other factors, how do they contrast with our protagonists and expand on the world of the media we're viewing? Powers versus tools. Strength versus emotion. Ego versus Vengeance, Fanboy versus Idol, and Incel versus Evil. Each and every one of these matchups portray a unique dynamic. While some of them have similarities, there are no direct evil counterparts to be found. I hope that someday, villains of this level will be the standard. But until then, we just have to keep praising the villains that do it right. Injustice Superman and his global takeover. 
using other people's fear of him to his advantage. Omni-Man, and a global takeover of his own, using his brute force to either scare people into joining his empire, or to destroy anyone who opposes him. But those principles are subject to change over time. Homelander, using his own intimidation in order to keep people in line to satisfy his grandiose sense of self, and Syndrome and Megamind, once again showing us how people can change their own beliefs over time. As people grow and mature, or if those grow to harbor resentment towards their heroes. These are truly some evil supermen.